uh, involved in, in this kind of or similar research? This probably uh, would just classify as normal uh, plasma physical investigation. Hmm. But but um, but this particular experiment isn't like ongoing right now or something like that. Not as far as I know. Hmm. But I, I I am working with a team of plasma physicists who are um, working on the petroglyph data I've I've mentioned in the previous interview. Right. In the the, the first installment, and uh, with those people I, I am working on uh, a model, a plasma physical model of the way such a, an auroral column mm. could have evolved over time. So that is, that, that's the only laboratory in the world investigating this uh, that I'm aware of. Mm. The uh, We talked about the planet Venus here uh, and the yeah, possible... May I, may I just add that sure. um, we should also bear in mind that it doesn't have to have been the planet Venus that uh, produced this uh, phenomenon in the sky. Right, it, it might have been a, a comet or another body, From so to speak. From the perspective of ancient societies or traditional societies, a morning star is simply the first object you see in the morning sky. Right. So if there had been any other body, uh, perhaps a cometary body in the sky or any other phenomenon mm. that could have produced the same effect, then who knows? That, that may be the explanation too. So right. you need to keep all options open, I'd say, at this phase. Definitely. Uh, would you um, say that this is the same idea as the Ouroboros? Or, or do you think that the Ouroboros represents something even larger, I've heard the idea again of, of uh, uh, that even the galactic center actually is the mouth and the tail of the Ouroboros, and that this is what it's represented in that symbol or idea. Uh, w- would you agree or, uh, on that or not? No, I wouldn't agree with that um, because I, I don't, I don't see how ancient societies could have seen uh, the structure of the galaxy as such. I think that the Euroboros, uh, the, the origin of the motif, must be sought in something that societies worldwide could have just seen in the sky quite easily. Something close to Earth. And something permanent enough for people to uh, to have drawn and carved into rock as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, yeah, uh, uh, yeah um, the likeliest explanation of the Euroboros is a plasma phenomenon. And to be more specific... It's an instability type that uh, is known as a diocotron instability. So it's a ring-shaped instability of the plasma column. Okay. And we've been able to demonstrate that this actually occurs as part of the same auroral pillar that I was just talking about. Right, really. It's actually a feature that uh, that occurs uh, somewhere close to the top end of the lower part of the, uh, the column. Mm-hmm. It, this may sound a bit complicated, but it has a specific position in the column and also in the chronology of the column. Intriguingly, that's exactly the position where mythology puts the Euroboros. It's usually, the dragon is usually coiled around the foot of the tree, the foot of the cosmic mountain. Yeah. So it's exactly in the right position where uh, you would expect it, on the basis of human tradition. Hmm. So the Euroboros is the tail-biting dragon, the round dragon, is a type of dragon amongst several, Um, so it's not necessarily the same phenomenon as uh, the morning star dragon, the Quetzalcoatl type, Mm. Uh, but whether they they could be part of the same phenomenon, that is still to be seen. And I like to just work uh, from the the data upwards, I like to have a bottom-up approach rather than a top-down approach in my research. Right. So when I'm looking at thousands of stories of dragons and traditions, depictions, I'm just sorting them into basic form categories, basic morphological categories. Mm. So you have helical dragons, you have uh, double helix shaped dragons, you have simple um, spirals, uh, and you have the Euroboros, the round dragon. So it's one type. And it's not impossible that at some point we can demonstrate that one form morphs into the other. It may well be. That's how Coatl, for instance, is also known to uh, have appeared as a Euroboros. Huh. We have a couple of uh, medieval objects from Mexico where he's actually shown as a tail-biting dragon. Hmm. So the, it may it may be the same physical phenomenon, but then it may not be. And the Euroboros definitely belongs in the the, mytholo- the wider mythology of the world axis. Hmm. We can conclusively demonstrate that. We can also demonstrate that it has a plasma prototype. So I'd say this is as close as you get to uh, a proper scientific model of uh, this mythical motif. 
Fascinating. Um, how about the, uh, because I know that you've written a little bit about this, the uh, the winged disc, basically, the emblem from, from the ancient or Near East, you know, it's it's common in art and art, 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 architecture down there. Um, how would you explain this in, in the model that we're talking about here? Once again, uh, the ring disc, I'd say, would belong would belong in the uh, mythology of the world axis, and it has a, a precise uh, position within the the structure of the column. It's the top segment. If you look at the um, the uh, depiction of the ring disc in ancient Egypt, mm-hmm. you'll find that it's most of the time not placed on uh, a pillar. But in uh, Hittite examples, and examples from the Levant, from uh, from Syria and Phoenicia, mm-hmm. you do see that the ring disc is placed on top of a pedestal or a, a pillar. Right. And that's the natural position. It corresponds in Egyptian text to uh, the god, the solar god Horus or Osiris, who rests on top of his uh, support, on top on top of his pillar. Mm-hmm. He's also a bird, so it's basically the solar bird, the phoenix bird atop his tree or mountain. So you can you can confirm this basic uh, configuration in uh, quite a few different ways, including iconography. So the winged disc has its home, again, in world access mythology. Hmm. Yeah, that's fascinating. Uh, <laughs> if, if, that is, if that is so, then it follows that the winged disc can't really be the same as the sun we look at today. Right. Hmm. Our sun has no direct connection to the column they are hypothesizing to have existed. Exactly. That's a difficult question because we also know for a fact that the winged disc in Egypt, at some point in time, definitely signified the sun. Hmm. There's no doubt about that either. My working hypothesis on this is that uh, we're looking at an evolution of ideas. So the winged disc, at a distant point in time, say th- during the 3rd, 4th millennium BC, would have related to this super aurora. But in the course of time, as those extreme auroral events were no longer visible, and the sky looked exactly as it does today, tranquil, Mm -hmm. people would still have been stuck with the old traditions. And the obvious uh, correlate, or the equivalent of the old winged solar bird, Mm -hmm. would have been the sun. Hmm. Perhaps to other societies, the morning star. So you you would have seen a transfer of symbols from the objects that previously existed in the electrically active sky mm. to objects we see in the modern sky today. Hmm. So it's quite complex. Uh, you, you need, yeah, we, we always need to keep an eye on the way these ideas develop over time. So the winged disc is our present sum too, but only in the later traditions, if that makes any sense. Mm, yeah, definitely. I hear what you're saying, that this has been uh, transmuted or, or transformed into what we can um, yeah, you, you see the same thing with the Euroboros. If you look at the very earliest evidence we have, mm. Euroboros is usually identified, it's identical with the circular ocean that surrounds the disk of the Earth. Mm-hmm. So you have a pancake-shaped Earth, and there's a ring of water around it, the circular ocean, and the dragon is identical with that ocean. So that's a Euroboros in the oldest form. Mm, yeah. What happens next is, during the first millennium BC, astronomy begins to develop. And people, the Greeks especially, begin to model uh, the planets as nested spheres. The Aristotelian uh, astronomy Mm -hmm. begins. And at that point, uh, the Euroboros is no longer a surrounding ocean. He then becomes adapted to the ecliptic band. So the zodiac, zodiac, basically, the belt of the zodiac, the circle around the Earth, with the star signs, becomes then the carrier of the Euroboros symbol. So we really have to deal with this whole complexity and uh, and, and give every tradition we have its place in this uh, complicated uh, development. So it's and, quite a task to uh, to unravel it all. Oh yeah, de- definitely. And and what I find interesting, though, in one way too, is that um, you know the further out we can look, so to speak, into the universe, we always find uh, something to to adapt that previous symbol upon, meaning that. Uh, you know, as as I mentioned today, uh, some people suggest that that the Ouroboros actually is is the um, the galaxy itself, and even the center of the galaxy is the, is the head and the tail, and and to some extent, I mean that works still today as a kind of symbol, although that that might not have been the origins of the symbol. You know. Yeah, perhaps I, I could just say a little more about that. Um, 
I wouldn't, I wouldn't agree that the observation of the galaxy itself inspired the Uroboros, but the morphology you see there, the shape you see there, may physically actually be similar to the Uroboros that was really seen close to, uh, close to the Earth, because it's the same plasma. Plasma is highly scalable. As yeah. So mm -hmm. on the very same scale, you see the same types of instabilities taking place far out in space. Right. So ultimately, yeah. it may still be a similar phenomenon, though not exactly the one we are looking at in the ancient sources. Right, right. Well, that, so that's... I, I do believe we're looking at, if you like, uh, an auroral ring phenomenon as the origin of the prototype. And there is actually, or the origin of the archetype, sorry. Right, right. And there's actually a monograph co coming up on this subject, on the Uroboros, mm -hmm. that I've been working on over the past uh, one or two years. Wow. Fascinating. These things together, I think, all evidence uh, up until the early Middle Ages that we know of hmm. it was really comprehensive as a study. Wow, wow, fascinating. Um, you know, there there are other things also that that pop up here that that you've been writing upon and and uh, that that have you know really been fascinating to dive into. Uh, one of those things are. Um, the the nine steps basically if we, if we look at uh, some of the pyramid models uh, again going into South America primarily but also there are some uh, in um, uh, in in Egypt or the Babylonian ziggurats uh, that you've been looking at and most of these have seven or, or nine levels or steps to them uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about that and why they designed it in that way absolutely. Symbologists have for a long time asked the question, why are the numbers 7 and 9 so important in ancient traditions? And one of the most obvious answers was the seven planets, or perhaps the seven stars in the Pleiades, or the constellation of the Ursa Major, the Great Bear. Mm -hmm. The answer to that is that, unfortunately, if you look at the very earliest uh, mentions of sevens in uh, religious text and mythological text, that there isn't any demonstrable connection with the planets. You often have the seven demons, the seven underworlds, the seven heavens, blah, 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 in, in ancient traditions, who have nothing to do with the planets. Hmm. And an interest in the seven planets arises only at a much later uh, segment in time, let's say the mid-second millennium BC. Hmm. So there are, there are lots of special sevens and nines long before the, the planets were ever grouped together as, as, as uh, a group of seven. Hmm. So that isn't the answer. And, but what, what else could it be? I would argue um, that uh, plasma, again, furnishes a very int intriguing answer. If you, again, look at a plasma cylindrical column, and the, uh, the intensity of the electric charge is high enough, then plasma has the, uh, the propensity to pinch itself. It will pinch into a, pre a preference of nine plasmoids, nine little units on top of each other. So it will look like a string of sausages, in a sense. <laughs> And at a further uh, point in the sequence, um, the um, the points where the, the plasma, well, the plasmoids themselves will basically flatten out. Mm -hmm. So what you'll get is something very similar to a ladder or a staircase. <laughs> and this is something that is uh, known experimentally, again, in the laboratories. Plasma physicists have produced these forms and they know how to produce them. The knowledge is very recent, again. Could something like that have occurred in the sky close to the Earth? And could something like that have been witnessed by human beings mm -hmm. within the past 10,000 years? I'm inclined to say yes, a resounding yes. <laughs> because there's, there's no... Well, because this is uh, arguably the, the, the most feasible explanation for the, the abundant traditions we have about seven. Mm -hmm. if, if you look at the context in which the number seven and nine occur in ancient societies, you often find that um, seven and nine are the number of the heavens uh, counted. So right. traditional societies will say there are seven heavens on top of each other, like mm. pancakes mm -hmm. stacked on top of each other. Or there are seven underworlds or nine heavens. Yeah. Or there is one big staircase to the sky that leads up to the pole star. Hmm. And there are nine steps on it. And the ancestors used to uh, climb up and down that ladder. And at some point... A tragic catastrophe occurred, and it was brought down. It collapsed, and the whole world was set afire. Yeah. This is the uh, the original context, the Zitzim Leben of uh, 